Ladies and gentlemen, please join me to welcome the keynote speaker of our first annual international conference on ethnic and religious conflict resolution and peace building, Ambassador Susan Johnson Cook. I see trees of green, red roses too. I see them blue. Good morning. It is such an honor to be with you this morning. I bring you greetings. I'm a native New Yorker. So for those from out of town, I welcome you to our city, New York, New York. The city's so nice, they have named it twice. And we are really thankful to Basil Ligori and his family and to all of those who are members of the board and to all of those who are members of the body of ISERM and to each of you who are present today and also those online, I greet you with joy. I am so delighted and ignited and excited to be the first keynote speaker for the first conference as we explore the theme advantages on ethnic and religious identity on conflict mediation and peace building. It certainly is a topic dear to my heart and I hope to yours. Uh, as Basil said, for the past four and a half years, I had the privilege and honor and pleasure of serving President Barack Obama, the first African-American president of the United States. And I want to thank him and Secretary Hillary Clinton for nominating me, appointing me, and for helping me get through two Senate confirmation hearings. Um, but it was such a joy to be there as uh, your woman in Washington and to continue as a, as a diplomat um, speaking all over the world. Uh, so it's many things that have happened for me. I had um, all 199 countries as part of my portfolio. Many ambassadors are what we know as chiefs of mission, and they have a particular country, but I had the whole globe. And so it was um, quite an experience looking at foreign policy and national security, really from a faith-based perspective. I think it was really significant that he had a faith leader in this particular role. And so being a faith leader, sitting at the table, sitting across from cultures that many were faith-led, uh, really provided quite an insight and also shifted the paradigm, I believe, in terms of diplomatic and diplomacy all over the globe. There were three of us who were faith leaders in the administration. Uh, we all have moved on um, at the end of last year. Uh, but Ambassador Miguel Diaz was <clears throat> the, <clears throat> excuse me, the ambassador to the Holy See at the Vatican. Ambassador Michael Battle was the ambassador for the African Union. And I was the ambassador for international religious freedom. So to have three clergy scholars at the diplomatic table was quite, quite progressive. As an African-American, female faith leader um, who was not only on the front lines of churches and temples and synagogues, uh, but also on 9-11. I was on the front lines as a police chaplain here in New York City. But now having been to the senior level of government as a diplomat, it, I've experienced life and leadership from many different perspectives. You know, I've sat with elders, I've sat with the Pope, I've sat with youth, I've sat with NGO leaders, faith leaders, corporate leaders, government leaders to try to get a handle on the very subject that we're talking about today that this conference is exploring. Because when people really identify themselves, ourselves, we really can't separate or negate ourselves from who we are. And each of us has deep cultural, ethnic roots. Uh, we have faith, we have religious natures of our being. Many states that I presented myself in front of were states that ethnicity and religion was part of its culture. And so it was very important to be able to understand that there were many layers. I just got back from Abuja prior to um, leaving in Nigeria, um, Basil's home country. And it was not just one thing that you went in to talk about. You had to look at the complexities of culture and ethnicities and tribes that went back several hundred years. But almost every religion, almost every state has some sort of welcoming, blessing, dedication, christening, service for the new life as it enters the world. And then there's several, several rituals that happen for that life for the various stages of development, bar mitzvahs and bas mitzvahs and rites of passage and confirmations. So religion and ethnicity are integral to the human experience. 
And so religious ethno leaders become important to the part of the discussion because they don't have to always be part of the formal institution. In fact, many religious leaders, actors, and interlocutors can really separate themselves from some of the bureaucracy that many of us had to deal with. I can tell you as a pastor going into the State Department with the layers of bureaucracy, I had to shift my thinking, I had to shift my paradigm because the pastor in an African-American church is really the queen bee or the queen king, or the king bee, if you want to say it. But and when you go, you have to understand who the principles are. And I was the mouthpiece of the president of the United States and the secretary of state, and there were many layers in between. So to write a speech, when I would send it out, it would come back after 48 different eyes saw it, and it would be very different than I, what I originally sent. But that's understanding the bureaucracy that you're under. Religious leaders not in an institution can really be transformational because many times they are free of the chains of authority. Uh, so there are pluses and there are minuses um, because sometimes uh, that people who are religious leaders are confined to their own little world and they live in their bubble, their religious bubble. Um, and so they're in their community and so when they see people who do not walk like, speak like, act like, think like themselves, Sometimes there's conflict inherent just in their myopia. And so it's important to be able to look at the total pictures to today, which is what we're looking at, because when religious actors have been exposed and have, they can be really part of the mix, they can really be part of, the, of mediation and peace building. Um, I was privileged to sit at the table when Secretary Clinton created what was called the strategic dialogue with civil society. And many faith leaders and ethnic leaders, NGO leaders, were invited to the table with government. Instead of government saying this is what they believe, it was a chance for them to, and us to say what we actually believed. So I believe there are several keys uh, to ethno-religious uh, approaches to conflict resolution and peace building. First, as I said earlier, is that religious leaders, ethnic leaders, have to be exposed to life in its fullest, um, not just staying in their own world, in their little confines, but really being um, open to the broadness of what society has to offer. Here in New York City, we have 106 different languages, 108 different ethnicities. And so you have to really be able to be exposed to the whole world. I don't think it was any accident that I was born in New York, the most diverse city in the world. In my apartment building, uh, where I lived in, in the Yankee Stadium area, they called it the Marasenia area, on my floor there are 17 apartments, and there were 14 different ethnicities on that particular floor. So we grew up really understanding each other's cultures. We grew up as friends. It was not you are Jewish, and you're Caribbean American, and you're African. We grew up as friends and neighbors, and we began to come together and be able to see a worldview. My children now, uh, for their graduation presents, are going to the Philippines and to Hong Kong, so they are citizens of the world. And I think that religious ethnic leaders have to make sure that they are citizens of the world and not just their world. Because when you are really myopic and you don't, are not exposed, that is what leads to religious extremism. Because you think that everybody thinks like you, and if they don't, then they're out of whack. Well, really, if you're not thinking like the world, you're out of whack. So I think that we have to really look at the total picture. One of the uh, prayers that I took with me on the road uh, as I traveled on a flight almost every other week was from the uh, Old Testament, which was the Jewish scriptures, because Christians are really Judeo-Christians, uh, but it was from the Old Testament. It was called the Prayer of Jabez, and it's found in 1 Chronicles 4.10. And one version said is, Lord, increase my opportunities that I might touch more lives for you, not that I might get the glory, but that you might get more glory. But it was about increasing my opportunities, expanding my horizon. Take me places that I have not been so that I might understand and comprehend those who may not be like me. And I found it to be very helpful um, at the diplomatic table and in my life. The second thing that needs to happen is that governments must make the effort to bring ethnic and religious leaders to the table. I shared with you the strategic dialogue that was created with civil society, but also there were public-private partnerships brought into the State Department, because one thing I've learned is you've got to have funds to fuel the vision. And unless you have the resources at your hand, then we really don't get anywhere. To today was courageous for Basil to put this together, but it takes funds to be in the area of the United Nations to be able to put these conferences together. So the creation of public-private partnerships. And then we also had faith leader roundtables. 
And that faith leader was not, faith leaders were not limited to just clergy, but it was also those who were members of faith groups who began to help whoever identified themselves as a faith group. So it went from the three Abrahamic traditions, but also to Scientologists and Baha'is and other faiths that identified themselves as a faith. So we have to be able to listen and have conversations. And Basil, I really applaud you for the courage of bringing us together this morning. It's courageous and it's so important. Let's give him a hand. And to your team, I hope I have to put this together. Um, so I believe um, all religious and ethnic leaders um, can make sure that they are exposed and that governments can't just see their own perspective, nor can faith communities just see one perspective, but all of those leaders must come together. Because many times, um, religious and ethnic leaders are really suspect of governments because they believe that they have the company, the party line, and so it must be important for everybody to sit at the table together. The third thing that needs to happen is religious and ethnic leaders uh, must make a special concerted effort to interact with other ethnicities and other religions that are not their own. Um, right before 9-11, um, right I was a pastor in Lower Manhattan, where I'll be going after this conference to get today. I, I pastored the oldest Baptist church in New York City. It was called Mariner's Temple, uh, first female in 200-year history of the American Baptist churches. Um, and so what it did, it is instantly made me kind of part of what they call the big steeple churches. My church was huge. Uh, we grew quickly. And so it allowed me to interact with pastors like at Trinity Church on Wall Street and Marble Collegiate Church. And the pastor, the late pastor of Marble Collegiate, his name was Arthur Caliandro. And at the time, a lot of children were disappearing or getting killed in New York. And he called what he called the big steeple pastors together. Um, and so it became imams and rabbis, the rabbis of Temple Emmanuel and imams of mosques throughout New York City. And we came together and formed what was called the Partnership of Faith of New York City. And so when 9-11 happened, we were already partners. And so we didn't have to try to understand different religions. We already were one. And it wasn't just a matter of sitting around a table and having breakfast together, which is what we did monthly. But it was about being intentional about understanding each other's cultures so that we had social events together. We would exchange pulpits. So a mosque might be in a temple, and a mosque might be in a church, and vice versa. We shared seders at Passover time, so it would be a Christian and a Jew. And all of the events so that we understood each other socially. So we wouldn't plan a banquet when it was Ramadan. You know, we, we understood and respected and learned from each other that when it was fasting time for a particular religion or when it was holy high days for the Jews or when it was Christmas or the seasons that were Easter that were important to us. And we began to really intersect. And so the Partnership of Faith of New York City continues to thrive and be alive. And so as new pastors and new imams and new uh, rabbis come into the city, they already have a welcoming, interactive, interfaith group. And so it's very important that we not only stay outside of our own world, but that we interact with others uh, so that we might learn. Um, but let me tell you where my real heart is, that it's not just religious ethno, but it also has to be religious ethno gender inclusivity. And uh, women have been absent from the decision making and diplomatic tables, but they're present in conflict resolution um, and so what was probably the most powerful experience for me was traveling to Liberia, West Africa, and sitting with the women. Two of them became uh, uh, a Nobel Peace Prize winners, but sitting with the women who had actually brought peace to, to Liberia um, at a time when there was extreme war uh, between the Muslims and the Christians, and men were killing each other. And the women, dressed in white, said, we're not coming home, we're not doing anything until there's peace. And so they band together as Muslim and Christian women. In fact, they formed a human chain all the way up to parliament. And they sat in the middle of the street, and they did activities. So when a Muslim was killed, Christians went, when, and vice versa. And the women who met in the marketplace say, we shop together, so we've got to bring peace together. And it was revolutionary to, that, to Liberia, where peace was actually brought. So women have to be part of the discussion uh, for conflict resolution and peace building. Uh, women who are engaged in peace building and conflict resolution draw support from religious and ethno organizations worldwide. And women tend to uh, deal with relationship building. 
and are able to reach across lines of tension um, very easily. And so it's very important that we have women um, at the table because in spite of their absence from the decision-making table, Women of faith are already on the front lines of peace building, not just in Liberia, but throughout the world. So we've got to move past words and into action to find a way for women to be included, to be listened to, to be empowered, to work for peace in our communities. Um, and even though they're disproportionately affected by conflict, women have been the emotional and spiritual backbone bone of communities in time of attack have mobilized our communities for peace and mediated disputes and found ways to help the community step away from violence. When you look at it, you know, women represent 50% of the population. So if you exclude women from these discussions, we're negating half of the needs of an entire population. But I'd like to also commend another model to you. It's called the sustained dialogue approach. And I was fortunate just a few uh, weeks ago to sit with the founder of that is a man named Harold Saunders. Uh, they're based in Washington, D.C., but on uh, 45 college campuses, uh, this model has been used for ethno-religious uh, conflict resolution and bringing leaders uh, together to bring peace from high school to college to adults. And some of the things that need to happen with this particular methodology is one, persuading enemies to talk to one another. Um, and then two, what do they do if there's an identity clash that gives them an opportunity to vent, to, if it means yelling and screaming, because number three, gradually they get tired of yelling and screaming, and they have to name the problem. What are you yelling and screaming about? You know, what are you so angry about? And people have to really be able to name that. Sometimes it's historical tension, and it's just been going on for years and years, and so you're like, at some point we've got to, let this in, like they used to talk about the McCoys. At some point, this has to, has to end. So they have to name the problem. And then the people have to uh, open up and begin to share what, not only what they're angry about, but what the possibilities might be if we get past this anger. And then they have to come to some consensus. So the sustained dialogue approach, Harold Saunders, is something I commend to you as well. But I've also um, established what's called the pro-voice movement for women. Um, it, in my world where I was uh, ambassador, it was a very conservative movement, and you always had to identify whether you're a pro-life or a pro-choice. And my thing is that was still very limiting. That came, those were two limiting options, and they came from men usually. And so pro-voice is a movement that's bringing, um, in New York, primarily black and Latina women together for the first time to the same table. We've cohabitated, we've grown up together, but we've never been at the table together. And pro-voice means that every voice matters. Every woman has a voice in every arena of her life, not just our reproductive system, but we have a voice in everything that we do. Mm -hmm. And so we are just starting the in your packets. The first meeting is next Wednesday here in New York, October 8th at the Harlem State Office Building. So those who are here, um, please feel welcome to join us. The Honorable Gail Brewer, who's the Manhattan Borough President, will be in dialogue with us. But we're talking about women winning. Um, you know, not being in the back of the bus or in the back of the room, but women winning. And so pro, both pro-voice and sustained dialogue look at the problems behind the problems. They're not necessarily just methodologies, but they're bodies of thought and practice. How do we move forward together? And so we hope to amplify, unify, multiply the voices of women through the pro-voice movement. And it's online as well. We have a beginning of our website, provoicemovement.com. But they're relationship-based because we're building relationships. Relationships are essential to dialogue and mediation and ultimately peace. When peace wins, everyone wins. Um, and so what we're looking at is how do we uh, collaborate? How do we communicate? How do we find consensus? How do we coalition build? So that one of the things I learned in government is that no one person, no one entity can do it alone any longer. Uh, number one, you don't have the energy. Number two, you don't have the funds. But number three, there's so much more strength when you do it together because you can go an extra mile or two. And they also require not just relationship building, but they require listening. And I believe if there's any skill that women have is uh, that we are great listeners. Um, so these are worldview movements for the 21st century. Um, in New York, we're going to concentrate on blacks and Latinas coming together. In Washington, we're going to look at liberals and conservatives coming together. But women being 
um, strategized for change, uh, listening enough to one another that uh, change is inevitable and important for us. So relationship-based, communication-based, listening to one another. I'd like to also commend some reading and some programs to you. Uh, the first book that I commend to you is called Three Testaments um, by Brian Anthony Brown. It's a big, thick book. It looks like what we used to call an encyclopedia. But it has the Quran, it has the New Testament, it has the Old Testament. Um, and it's three testaments together, um, examining the three major Abrahamic religions um, and looking at places that we can find some similarity and commonality. Um, in your packet is a, is a card for my new book called Becoming a Woman of Destiny. Uh, the paperback comes out tomorrow. You can blow us away. It can become a bestseller if you go online and get it. Um, but it's based on the biblical Deborah or Deborah um, from the Judeo-Christian scriptures and judges uh, who was a woman of destiny. She was multifaceted. She was a judge. She was a prophetess. She was a wife. And it looks at how she managed uh, her life to also bring peace to her community. Uh, the third uh, reference that I would like to give you is called um, Religion, Conflict, and Peace Building, and it's available through USAID. And it talks about what this particular day examines today. I would certainly commend this to you. And for those interested in women and religious peace building, uh, it's called Peace Works, and the title is Women in Religious Building. Uh, and it's done by the Berkeley Center con in conjunction with the United States Institute for Peace. And the last one I've got to squat down because it fell. Excuse me. Oh, thank you. Uh, it's the program that I met. It's a young man. This is a high school program called Operation Understanding. It brings together Jewish and African American high schoolers uh, who not only sit around a table together, they travel together. So they went into the deep south, they will go into the Midwest, they come into the north, uh, and they will begin to go overseas to understand um, each other's cultures. So that, uh, you know, the Jewish bread may be my, w one thing and the black bread may be cornbread, but how do we find the places that we can sit and learn together? And these high schoolers are revolutionizing. Uh, what we're trying to do in terms of peace building and really conflict resolution. Um, they spent some time in Israel, and they will continue to spend some time in this nation. So I commend these programs to you. Um, a wonderful, wonderful young man is executive director, and I was just very impressed. So I'm convinced that we have to listen to what people on the ground are saying, people living in situations are saying in my travels abroad, I actively sought to hear what people, particularly at the grassroots level, were saying. It's one thing to have religious and ethnic leaders, but those who are on the grassroots level can begin to share positive initiatives that they are taking that sometimes work through a structure, but many times uh, they work on, because they're organized on their own. So I've learned that we can't come in with preconceived notions that are set in stone about what a group needs to achieve peace or conflict resolution, but we've, it's a collaborative process that takes place over time. We can't be in a hurry because the situation didn't get into that situation in a short period of time. And as I said, sometimes it's layers and layers, complexities that have happened over years and sometimes hundreds of years. So when we are ready to pull back the layers, like the layer of an onion, what we have to do uh, is understand the long-term change does not happen immediately. And that governments alone cannot do it. But those of us in this room, religious and ethnic leaders who are committed to the process, can do it. So I believe that we all win when peace wins. I believe that we want to continue to uh, do good work because good work receives good results in a matter of time. And wouldn't it be great if the press uh, would cover events like this um, in terms of us really trying to give peace a chance. There's a song that says, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. Well, I hope today that we've begun that process and by your presence and by your leadership and bringing us all together, I believe that we have really put a notch on that belt in terms of getting closer to peace. It is my pleasure to have been with you, to share with you. I'd be happy to answer any questions, but thank you so much for this opportunity, for your first conference to be your first keynote. Thank you very much.